Well, hello there. I'm your host for today, Dr. Kate Kresge, and we are interviewing Dr. Anthony Yoon, America's holistic plastic surgeon. He's going to share with us today the secrets to looking like your best self, to enhancing your collagen naturally, the plant-based alternatives to retinol, and other secrets to look better, faster, naturally, without chemicals or risky procedures. You'll love learning from him today. If you're someone who's looking to look and feel your best without spending a ton or using toxic chemicals. Dr. Anthony Yoon, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm so thrilled you're here. So you have two, multiple incredible books, but the two that I have on my shelf are The Age Fix and Younger for Life. And you are America's holistic plastic surgeon. And I wanted to ask you, the thing I've been so curious about is that you're an incredible surgeon. You have great reviews. People love your work. You could be just in an office somewhere doing expensive surgeries, you know, making a ton of money and just doing that. And yet you have dedicated so much of your time to educating people about the things that they can do for free to look better. Why is that so important to you? Well, I think that in the end, it comes down to, as a physician, always doing what's best for my patients. And, you know, I was trained at Michigan State University. I got my MD. I did three years of general surgery residency. I did two years of plastic surgery residency. I did a year fellowship out in Beverly Hills with a top name plastic surgeon. And I really learned a lot about how to be a good plastic surgeon or hopefully great plastic surgeon. But what we didn't learn about is how do you prevent somebody from needing it? And I reached a point in my career, it was actually pretty close to when I had written The Age Fix, that I realized that what I was taught was missing out. And I was taught all about how to use surgery and injections to help somebody look and feel their best. But there's so much more out there that I was never taught. And I didn't realize this until I had a patient of mine who I did a facelift on who had a terrible complication. And it got me into really thinking, like, was I taught really the right goal of being a plastic surgeon? And I was always taught the goal of being a surgeon was to bring people to the operating room. And I realized that that goal is wrong. It should be, how do I keep people out of the operating room? Now, Kate, you know, there are a lot of conditions that necessitate surgery if you're going to truly effectively treat them. So I'm not worried that I'm not going to have surgery to do or anything like that. But more and more, especially as technology has gotten better and better, we have so many other options to turn back the clock, to look and feel our best without going under the knife. Why not start, th start there? And that's how it always has been with me. And my practice has always been that. You know, there's some doctors where their consultation is, how do I get them to sign up for as much surgery as I can? And for me, it's always been doing whatever is best for the patient. And sometimes the answer is don't do surgery. And that's okay. You know, in the end, I have plenty of people who want surgery and who can really benefit from it. But it's trying to get those people who maybe can benefit from not doing it. Those are the keys as well, because I mean, in the end, it's just about having happy patients. I love that. So you have a term that I actually have never heard before reading your books called autojuvenation. What is that? So autojuvenation is this belief that our bodies all contain immense regenerative abilities to turn back the clock naturally. But in order for our bodies to do that, we have to literally unlock it. We have to give our bodies the right information, the right environment, the right keys to do that. And it comes down to really five main things. It is what you eat, when you eat, nutritional supplements, skincare, and non-invasive treatments. And if you focus on these five things, and this is a big part of Younger for Life, my last book, I strongly believe that the vast majority of people can turn back the clock, they can get beautiful, healthy skin, they can increase their energy, and they can feel great about themselves and hopefully, hopefully prevent the need from going under the knife. This is such exciting news because I think a lot of us, and especially on social media recently, have seen people who are getting tons of procedures, they look amazing, but Maybe it's outside of our price range or we're scared of the side effects or it's not within our values. And so hearing that there are things you can do right now to help you look and feel younger is really encouraging. And I think for you to be saying that means it's definitely true because you also see the results of surgery, which I think most of us think are going to be much, much greater than anything we could ever do in our kitchen. Yeah. And that's the, fa the fact is, is that surgery, it's kind of like you're building a house when when I look at anti-aging overall, it's like you're building this house and surgery and injections like Botox, they're like the spire at the top of the house. 
when you're building a house, you don't think about, geez, what am I going to put on the roof? Like you think about starting out with the foundation and then you build the first floor and then the second floor. And last thing you think about is the attic or the spire at the top. And so what is the first floor? What's the foundation of that house that you're building? It truly is food. It's your diet. It's what you put into your body. That's going to be the first thing you want to focus on. And then you really build up from there. Now, I heard you in another interview explaining why Americans might be more at risk of some of the deficiencies in nutrients that you feel are really important for healthy skin and healthy aging. And you were talking about like the content of nutrients in our food and how that's changed over the last few years. So for someone at home who might be thinking like, well, I eat vegetables and, and fruit, so I can't possibly do anything more for my aging. What would you say to those folks? Well, there actually was a study and something I put in the book, and it was a study that looked between the years of 1950 and 1999. And they looked at the nutritional content of fruits and vegetables here in the United States uh, throughout that time and found a, a significant reduction in six key nutrients, three of them being ones that really come to mind for me and I focus on. The first one is vitamin C. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. It's, it's essential for the production of collagen. The second thing is iron. And the third is protein. Well, we've heard a lot lately. Um, good friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, been one that's been right on the forefront of the importance of that protein as a macronutrient and iron being also a big part of being healthy on the inside with your cells. And so it's really important, I think, to realize that this belief that a lot of people in functional medicine, alternative medicine have that our food is not as nutritious as it used to be, that our soil has been stripped of nutrients. So our food actually does not give us the same nutrients that maybe it gave to our grandparents. That has been proven true by this study. And that study ended in 1999. That's like 24, 25 years ago. How is it now? We have to assume it's even worse now. Yeah. So what do we do about it, right? Tell us. <laughs> Well, so the first thing is going to be following a lot of the things that you have recommended on this podcast about eating a rainbow of colorful fruits and vegetables, about eating healthy sources of protein, about eating healthy sources of fats, omega-3 fatty acid rich fish, same things with the monounsaturated fatty acids, you know, nuts and seeds and olive oils and avocado. So a lot of those things that people don't realize that people recommend for heart health, for metabolic health, that actually can be very healthy for your skin as well and for overall longevity. We also have to keep in mind that once again, in some ways it doesn't matter how much of this food that you eat because we do know that it does, is not as nutritious as it used to be and that's why I am a fan of supplementation. In general too, I'm a fan of organics, uh, trying to go organic when you can, understand that some people can't afford it and that's okay or maybe it's not accessible, but there are some studies that do show that organic food uh, may be more nutritious for people than conventionally grown produce. That's good insight. So if there was like a supplement starter pack, so let's say everyone listening, they're doing their heart healthy diet, they're eating their nuts and their seeds and their lean protein and their veggies and their fruit. What's the like Dr. Yoon supplement starter pack for beauty that you would want everybody to check with their doctor about and maybe start considering using today? Yeah. So I'm not a biohacker. I've got friends of mine who are biohackers. will take like 50, 60, hundred pills a day. And that's just not realistic for the majority of the population and for most of my followers as well. So for me, I focus Kate on very specific, easy to get supplements. So we talked about nutrient depletion. Nutrient depletion is one of the main causes of aging of our skin. And so why I recommend taking a daily multivitamin. Okay, so a daily multivitamin, super important for that. Second thing, I recommend taking an omega fatty acid supplement. So if you are a meat eater, then taking one that's made with fish oil, make sure it's high quality fish oil. If, however, you are vegetarian or vegan, then there are some good high quality omega-3 fatty acid supplements that are made from algae, algae-based, and that could be reasonable for somebody who doesn't eat meat. The third supplement that I recommend would be to take a daily probiotic, at least 3 billion colony forming units a day. And we know that the health of the microbiome actually is directly correlated to the health of the skin. We know about the gut brain axis. There's also a gut skin axis, a connection between the health of the microbiome of the gut and the health of our skin. There are actually studies that have been found that there are certain inflammatory skin disorders like eczema, like rosacea, even acne that do have a correlation to an unhealthy gut microbiome. And so once again, taking good uh, probiotic every day can help with that. And then I recommend taking an antioxidant supplement. Antioxidants fight free radicals, 
Free radicals and oxidation are one of the main causes of aging of our skin as well. And I would encourage you to take one with a mix of, of antioxidants like resveratrol and others. And then the final thing I would recommend, and this is controversial in traditional medicine, is a daily collagen supplement. Collagen supplements, I'm a big fan of. I'm happy to chat with you about that. Uh, but that's something that's super popular right now and with good reason because I do believe it works. Yeah, I want to drill into that because I think there's a lot of talk that there's no point in taking a collagen supplement. There's no way it's going to make it into your skin. Why has collagen come onto the scene in, and especially with anti-aging? Like how does it relate? And then how do people choose a product that's actually going to do what we want it to do? Yeah. So, you know, the, the argument against collagen is that people say, well, it's a big protein. How does it get absorbed? Are you even going to find it in, in your skin? How do you know it's going to get there? Why not just increase protein? And so really let's get down to kind of the science of it. You know, what is our skin made out of? Our skin is made out of 70 to 80% of collagen. Collagen is a part of our skin that makes our skin feel tight and strong and youthful and firm. And as we get older, we lose about 1% of the thickness of our collagen every year after about our mid twenties. Women, when they go through menopause, in the five years after menopause, they lose 30% of the thickness of collagen in their skin. This is a study found in the American Academy of Dermatology, 30% collagen loss in the five years after menopause. That's crazy. And they lose 2% a year of the thickness of collagen after that. And that's why you can see women who are in their 70s or 80s and their skin can be tissue paper thin to the point where you scratch them and it tears. And so- Eating enough high quality protein, that's super important as you get older to help to because collagen is a protein, okay? That can in general help. When you look at collagen supplements, collagen once again is a large protein. And the argument is that when you ingest it, how do you know that it's actually gonna be bioavailable, that your body is actually gonna absorb it? And the key really is to take a hydrolyzed collagen supplement or hydrolyzed collagen peptides. And what that means is that you take that collagen large protein and you break it down into individual amino acids or groups of amino acids called peptides. These are going to be much more bioavailable. They're going to be much more absorbable. And when you look at studies, studies have been found, they're actually meta-analyses now, huge, because there's so many studies on collagen supplementation. There are meta-analyses where you group all these studies together. There was one in 2021 of over 1,100 participants 90 days of hydrolyzed collagen supplementation, a significant improvement in the hydration and wrinkles of the skin. And there was another one that was just published last year, finding very similar effects of, in over 1,700 patients. And so really, you know, I think seven, eight years ago, if you say, hey, collagen supplements, they're a little bit controversial. The data is unclear. That may have been true five, seven, eight years ago. But that is not true anymore. The data is clear that taking a good hydrolyzed collagen peptide supplement can definitely help the collagen of your skin. Now, I want to know from you, is there a minimum effective dose that you've seen? Because I have clients come to me and maybe they're taking a liquid form of collagen and it's a very like it's like one gram of protein in the whole serving. What do you tell people to look for in terms of dose? It really depends. Everybody kind of takes a little bit different. You could see anything from like 12 grams to up to 30 for some. And so in my opinion, the studies I've looked at have not looked at dosing as being something that they've looked closely at. And so I can't tell you that, oh, you have to get a certain amount in order for that to impact your skin. I would say to take at least 10 grams in general and then kind of go from there, depending on how your stomach tolerates it. Most people's stomachs tolerate collagen pretty well. There are capsules that I'm not a big fan of just because it's so much easier to take a scoop of collagen and put it in your coffee or your tea every morning. If it's good hydrolyzed collagen peptides, it will typically dissolve pretty easily. And oftentimes they don't really have any taste to them. I have my own collagen supplement, full disclosure. My company is called Yoon Beauty and we have our supplemental collagen and it's our top seller we're actually a skincare company, but our collagen actually sells more than our top skincare product because it works and people get such a great result from it. Now, okay, you put it in your coffee. I put collagen in my coffee as well. And I actually really like the taste now. I feel like it gives it a little savory aftertaste and kind of cuts the acidity to where now I don't like drinking my coffee without it. Are you the same? Ours doesn't have any taste to it. So I actually put it in water. I used to do it in coffee a lot. And then I saw my dentist and she was like, why are you drinking so much coffee? You've got a lot of staining on your teeth. I'm like, no, I don't. 
And she looked at it, she gave me the little mirror, you know, and your mouth's wide open. I'm like, oh my gosh, there is standing there. So then I really, I, de- I only have coffee now, honestly, as an occasional treat. Otherwise, I mix my collagen with water. And because there's no taste to it, it just tastes like I'm drinking water. And the last time I went to the dentist, I'm actually going again today. So this was six months ago. She was like, dang, your, your teeth look really good. You must have stopped the coffee. So I'm like, yes, bonus. How did you do it? I need tips. I went to school in Seattle and I feel like I developed a very uh, friendly relationship. Oh, you've got that. Yeah, you see, it's that Starbucks. But yeah, I mean, there's some people that find that I've had some collagens that do have kind of a beefy taste to it. And some people kind of like it. Other people don't. For me, I prefer no taste at all. And it just tastes like I'm drinking hot water when I mix ours. Now, I've heard you talk about green tea. So as I'm thinking about like, oh, how would I stop drinking coffee? And that green tea is kind of like one of your beauty foods. Why is that? So green tea contains polyphenols. These are powerful antioxidants. When we look at aging of the skin, there are five main causes of aging of the skin. We mentioned nutrient depletion. And once again, really focusing on healthy sources of food, looking at potential supplements, going organic if you can afford it. But the other cause of aging of the skin, we talked about collagen degradation. So once again, focusing on collagen, eating healthy sources of protein. There's oxidation and free radicals. Once long ago, people thought that the main reason why we age was due to oxidation. And these are essentially abnormal molecules that are created by our body's own metabolism. So just the fact that we are alive, our bodies create free radicals as a waste product, essentially, of being alive. Now, our bodies also create antioxidants. Antioxidants will actually neutralize these free radicals. And somebody like yourself, Kate, where you're leading a healthy life, you're eating well, you're non-smoker, you're not vaping, you're not eating tons of ultra-processed foods, stuff like that, you may have a pretty good amount of antioxidants that kind of neutralize the free radicals and you're at a good steady state. But in somebody who is smoking, they are vaping, let's say they're exposed to a lot of automobile exhaust fumes during the day, they're eating a lot of ultra-processed foods, those are filled with free radicals, then your body can get into a situation that we call oxidative stress, where there's so many free radicals in your body that it actually will then damage the DNA of your cells. Once again, many years ago, anti-aging scientists believed that this was potentially the main cause of aging of our entire bodies. We know now that it's just one of the causes of aging, but it is significant. And so eating and ingesting antioxidants are a great way to fight that process from the inside out. And one of the best sources of antioxidants, green tea, one of the most powerful. And so that's why I'm a big fan of green tea. I, because once again, I don't drink a lot of coffee. I'm not a big caffeine guy. I try to stay away from it. I'm a surgeon, so I don't want to get jittery and stuff. So I try to go with caffeine free whenever I can. I heard you talking with a doc who tends to focus more on neurology about why you think beauty and brain health and cardiovascular health are all linked. And you you kind of talked about it with collagen and blood vessels. And I was wondering if you could explain that to our audience, because I thought that was a really insightful observation. Well, yeah, a lot of this now comes down to inflammation. And so I mentioned, okay, cause of aging of the skin, nutrient depletion, collagen degradation, oxidation. What's another cause of aging of the skin? One of the five is going to be inflammation. And chronic inflammation is the big issue that we have. Now, acute inflammation can actually be a really good thing. And I'm happy to chat about that in a little bit. But it is actually not a bad thing. And it can be very healing for our body to have some acute inflammation. But it's chronic inflammation that can be a big problem for us, you know. And when we do look at things, you know, when you talk about neurology and you're talking about cerebrovascular disease, you know, then that a lot of that can be due to chronic inflammation in our blood vessels. Our blood vessels basically have endothelium inside of them and they're made of collagen. And so once again, you've got to look at the health of the collagen of your skin and supporting all of that. But also fighting inflammation is a big, big thing because once again, that not only is a main cause of cerebrovascular disease, but it's a main cause of aging of the skin. So how do you fight inflammation? One good way to do it is to focus on the right types of foods. So there are anti-inflammatory foods I mentioned earlier taking an omega-3 fatty acid supplement, one of the main benefits of omega-3s like cold water fish, like salmon, tuna, trout, mackerel, those types of fish contain these omega-3 fatty acids that are anti-inflammatory. They will tamp down chronic inflammation. Another type of food that can reduce chronic inflammation are foods that contain probiotics in them. So fermented foods, So eating fermented foods that contain healthy probiotics like sauerkraut, like miso, like kombucha, like kimchi, 
These can also be very healthy and anti-inflammatory for the gut that can also then impact overall inflammation in our skin. And then the final thing really is reduce the amount of sugar that you eat. Sugar is the great ager of our skin. We believe that sugar can is doing so much more than we ever believed. You know, people used to think sugar, oh, diabetes, but it's so much more than that. Sugar has a massive impact on the skin by the processes of glycation and by the processes of chronic inflammation due to chronic insulin spikes. And so glycation is kind of this like fancy scientific term for essentially very simply is that when you ingest sugar, that sugar can bond to the collagen of your skin and cause that collagen to become kinked. So I mentioned earlier, collagen, 70, 80% of our skin, we lose it as we get older. They're like the logs of a log cabin. And as we get older, those logs start to fall apart. When you eat sugar, that sugar bonds to those logs that are falling apart and cause them to fall apart or kink even more. And that's one reason why we want to reduce the amount of sugar that we eat, because that can create this kind of inflammatory cascade of processes. Talk to us about like, what are some general principles that you kind of teach in your book about how to create a diet that optimizes your blood sugar or maybe when to stop eating in the day to optimize your blood sugar? Yeah. So really it comes down to something that we put in the book that I'm really excited about. It's a 21 day jumpstart where the focus really and what you've you know kind of focused on here is making very simple changes to your lifestyle that can create massive changes in how you feel and how you look. And so we did this thing and, and I tested on a small number of people for the book. And then once my book came out, Younger for Life, we tested on like 10,000 people signed up for it. And we had just these great results. So really what it is, it's a 21 day, three week program. The first week you clean up your diet. Okay. And essentially what you do is you get rid of foods that have added sugars. So, you know, soda pops, energy drinks, fruit juices, desserts, stuff like that. You get rid of gluten, okay, temporarily. We get rid of gluten, we get rid of dairy, and we get rid of ultra-processed foods, you know, so those foods like packaged snack goods and things like that. So the first week, the big thing diet-wise is let's clean things up, let's eat colorful fruits and vegetables, let's eat real foods, you know, not these ultra-processed foods. And then we put you on a very simple supplement regimen, basically just what I told you, those five supplements, so multivitamin, omega-3 fatty acid, probiotic, uh, antioxidant mix, and then collagen every day. And then we put people on a very simple skincare routine, takes literally two minutes a day. And so that was what they do for the first week. And then weeks two and three, they, inter they put in just a little bit of intermittent fasting, two days a week of intermittent fasting where they do a 16 hour fast and then an eight hour feeding window after that, just two days each of those weeks. So four intermittent fast for the three weeks. And what we found is that people had some massive changes, not only in how their skin looked, but in their energy level, people lost weight that they wanted to lose. But once again, the goal from us was seeing how does your skin look? And almost everybody said that their skin looked significantly better to the point where people would make comments to them who didn't even know that they were doing the 21 day jumpstart of like, wow, your skin looks so much better. What are you doing? Unsolicited comments like that. It's been really amazing. And so, you know, I did it on a relatively small number of people for the book, had really good success with it. And so when my book came out recently, we did it for 10,000 people who signed up for it and found same things. You know, people are like, wow, my skin looks so much better. My energy levels through the roof. And so really, the, and these are pretty small changes. You know, we're not talking about doing these crazy water fasts and like, diets that are hard to follow, like really easy. And I think one of the big things people said was I did not feel restricted at all during this time, which I think is so great because how many diets that people undertake, do they feel like, dang, like I'm starving or I, you know, I got to have some carbs, you know, I can't. And, and that's just not the case here. I really like that you have a week of sort of nutrient repletion before you have people start fasting. I think that's brilliant. And I've seen clinically that it helps people get much better outcomes because when you're starving for nutrients, it's really hard to fast. It doesn't feel good. When you're fulfilled and when you are completely replete with all the nutrients you need, you can fast so much more easily and you're not having cravings. You don't feel terrible. You actually can feel energized. Yeah. And then that brings us really to that fifth cause of aging of our skin. You know, we talked about four so far. The fifth one is going to be buildup of cellular waste. And so you know, building in that intermittent fasting, and, and I'm not one for you know, prolonged fasts, like I've 
done some of those before. It's just not my deal. But I do believe that everybody can do a, a good like 12 hour fast where you just give your body time, your gut time to rest and you promote the process of autophagy, that intracellular renewal and recycling process that doesn't happen if you're constantly eating. I do believe that that's very helpful for overall longevity as well as for the health of your skin. And so kind of getting our processes, our cells cleaned out so that they can function more efficiently, a great way to do that is just to take that time 12 to 16 hours. If you can do 16 hours, that's great. If you can't, that's okay. 12 hours is sufficient to get a little bit of that autophagy process going. I think that's very, very helpful. And so that kind of builds out those five cause evasion for skin and different things that you can do to, to target each one. I love, I feel like we've got the foundation now of our house. You've laid that really well with what we can do in our, in our supplement cabinet, in our kitchen, with our lifestyle. I want to make sure people understand. You were saying people do this stuff for a few weeks and everyone's saying, I can see a difference in your skin. What type of difference do we see? Is it, is it less wrinkles? Like what's going on there? Um, so it's not going to be this, you know, if you do before and after photos, your skin may look a little brighter. A lot of that honestly is going to be probably due to the skincare products. Okay. Because there's nothing that you're going to do diet wise that's going to make a wrinkle go away. Unfortunately, I love for that to be the case, but it's not true. And so it really does necessitate really focusing on the skincare in addition to those other parts of it. Um, so what you can get from it is not this before and after of like, oh my gosh, I had a facelift. No, you know, it really is going to be my skin looks a bit brighter. It looks healthier. It looks more radiant. That's the type of thing that you're going to get. Once again, if you say, geez, I've got frown lines, you know, between my eyebrows, is it going to make those go away? No, it's not. Is it going to make jowls disappear? No. But once again, it's, it, it's getting a brighter, healthier complexion, that type of thing. Now, as you stick with it, because really that's only three weeks, you know, I mean, three weeks is not a long time. And especially if you're adding the other different parts of it, like skincare, like some non-invasive treatments, then yes, you can see fine lines and wrinkles start to fit, you know, start to reduce. You can see dark spots start to fade. But once again, in three weeks, it's really tough to see that that quickly. Even like prescription strength creams that we may prescribe, you've got to wait six to eight weeks to truly see a lot of changes with even things like those. It's important to me that the supplements I take are of the highest quality. And that's why for the past few months, I've been drinking AG1. Unlike many supplement brands, AG1 is researched and developed by a team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionists with decades of experience in their respective fields. Quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword. It's a commitment backed by expert-led scientific research, high-quality ingredients, industry-leading manufacturing, and rigorous testing. At each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. For example, AG1 is NSF certified for sport, one of the most rigorous independent quality and safety certifications there is. But AG1 goes above and beyond those requirements. Instead of just testing for the industry standard of 10 contaminants and banned substances, AG1 tests for 950 of them. They obsess over product quality, standards of their manufacturing partners, and sustainable practices. Taking care of my health shouldn't be complicated, and AG1 makes it simple by helping me cover my nutritional basis and setting me up for success in just 60 seconds a day. AG1's ingredients are heavily researched for efficacy and quality, and I love that every scoop contains things like prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive support, B vitamins for energy, vitamin C and zinc for my immunity, and folate, magnesium, and ashwagandha for stress support. So if you want to get started with AG1, you can try it and get a free year of vitamin D3 and K2 as well as five free AG1 travel packs with your subscription at drinkag1.com slash root cause. That's drinkag1.com slash root cause. Check it out. Let's go back to your skincare routine. You said it's really simple, but effective. What do you recommend for skincare? Yeah, so you don't have to do like a Korean 12-step skincare routine. I mean, if you want to, you can, but you don't have to. And so what I recommend for people, and this was something we actually put a number of people on it. It's called the two minutes, five years younger skincare routine. And I'll explain why it's called that. But the skincare routine is this. Every morning, you cleanse your skin with a cleanser appropriate for your skin type. So if you've got, let's say, oily skin, then you want to look at doing a more foaming type of a cleanser. If you have drier skin or real sensitive skin, then look for a more milky or a hydrating type of a cleanser. After that, you want to apply an antioxidant serum. Once again, oxidation, free radicals, one of the main causes of aging of our skin. So we can fight that by ingesting antioxidant-rich foods, but you can also fight that by applying an antioxidant serum to your skin as well. And, and the most common antioxidant serum, vitamin C. Vitamin C 
if you actually combine it with vitamin E, it can be synergistic and it's antioxidant protection. And so if you find one with both, that's ideal. And then you want to apply an, an uh, SPF uh, sunscreen, at least SPF 30, if you're going to be going out. I have dermatology friends. They're like, they wear sunscreen, even if they're going to sit in a basement all day. I honestly don't. But when I'm going out, I definitely wear it because God forbid, Kate, you do not want to get a skin cancer of your face. And happy to chat about that if you want, because I know there's some, especially in the natural medic medicine community, functional medicine community who are really concerned about sunscreens. But anyways, that's what all I recommend in the morning. You know, if that's all you do, that's okay. Cleanse, antioxidant serum, sunscreen if you're going to go out. In the evening, so important, you got to cleanse your skin. You got to get rid of the day's worth of dirt, grime, oil, pollution, buildup, and the makeup. After that, you want to apply an anti-aging se uh, serum or cream. The one that we usually recommend to start with is retinol. Retinol is a derivative of vitamin A. If you were to ask plastic surgeons and dermatologists around the country, if you could pick one anti-aging ingredient, the vast majority would probably say retinol. Now, retinol is over-the-counter strength, so you can find that in a lot of over-the-counter skincare products. Tretinoin or Retin-A is prescription strength. So just a little tip, if you have real oily skin, real thick skin, and it's quite hardy, and you've got access to a doctor who will prescribe it for you, then you can always get tretinoin because that's going to be even stronger. And so apply an anti-aging cream at night. And then if you want to apply a moisturizer on top of that, you can, but moisturizers are optional. You know, if you have oily skin and you're living in New Orleans in August, you may not need a moisturizer. Okay, if you are living in Canada, in let's say Nova Scotia, and it's like February and you've got thin, dry skin, then probably a moisturizer could be very helpful for you. Okay, so really moisturizers are optional depending on whether you need it. And that's all you have to do at night cleanse, a retinol, and then moisturizer optional. And then once a week, if you have sensitive skin, two to three times a week, if you have quote unquote normal skin, you want to exfoliate your skin, you can do that either with a nice gentle scrub or you can do that with like a, an alpha hydroxy acid peel. That helps to get those skin cells turning over more quickly and causes your skin to feel smoother and look tighter afterwards. And that's it. So we, we did this, a very simple, you know, it literally takes two minutes a day. We had people with kind of average skin do it. And then two months later, we took photos of them before and after. And then we actually put it on Instagram and quiz people like, how much younger do you think they look? And we got an average of about five years younger. Now, that's not going to be the case with you, Kate, because your skin looks too good. You're not going to look five years young if you do these simple things. But for somebody who maybe doesn't take as great care of their skin, you know, they're kind of the soap and water type of people, then you can really see some nice changes with it in fairly short period of time. I will say I was a soap and water person before I got married. <laughs> and then my sister-in-law found out I was a soap and water person. And she said, Kate, you have to just invest in the bare minimum. <laughs> of like a face wash. And I didn't even know what a serum was. So for the person at home who's like me, who's thinking, what the heck is a serum? What do I even look for? What ingredients shouldn't be in there? What ingredients should be in there? How do you guide them through choosing a good one? So a serum basically is going to be like, how would I describe it? It's not like watery, like a toner. It's a little bit thicker than that, but it's not as thick as like a moisturizer or a lotion. So it kind of is like, like you have serum, you have like a toner that's going to be basically watery. The serum can be a little watery, but it also can be slightly thicker than that. And then after that, you have like lotions that are going to be thinner. And then you have creams and then you have like ointments. And the order in which you apply typically is lighter to heavier. So serums are going to be on the lighter side there for somebody who says, oh, I don't like it. Let's say somebody says, oh, I don't like uh, when I put a moisturizer on, my skin feels greasy. Then go with the serum first and see if the serum does enough for you. And serums can vary in just how thick they are actually. And as far as like, how do you know that you're avoiding potentially unhealthy ingredients? Because yes, the FDA is not very aggressive in making sure that we don't have potentially harmful ingredients in our skincare products. The term has been vilified, kind of like the term organic, but clean beauty products. There is like organic, like there are people who, you know, there's no real specific designated like, oh, this is clean, this is not. It's kind of a catch-all term, but you know if they're using that term, at least they've got the company has the thought in their mind of, hey, let's limit the additional additives and preservatives and fragrances and all that that may not be necessary in these products. Uh, and so even though, once again, it's not ideal, it's, it's one thing. Now, there are apps that you can go to. There's one very simple one called Think Dirty. Now, 
There are, I'm sure there are other dirty apps that you want to avoid, but this thing dirty app is specifically about clean and dirty products. And so you can always, if you go like to your local department store, it's actually an app and you, it has actually a UPC symbol reader and you can actually see if that product that you're looking at is on their database and they'll tell, they'll actually give it like a number type of grade of how quote unquote clean and dirty it is. So, um, so just a couple of tips to do that. Yeah. It's really apparent to me that you are just, you're trying to help people live their best life where they're at peace with themselves. They're happy, they're healthy and where their focus is actually not their appearance. They're kind of, they're set free from maybe a insecurity that they had and now they can go focus on other things. So yeah, it's beautiful. And I love that you also talked about trying to set up your patients who do have surgery to have a really successful surgery. So like, what can you do before? What can you do after that's going to maximize your healing? Is there anything we haven't talked about yet that you tend to advise people about just in terms of what they can do to, to heal up from surgery effectively? Yeah, this is something that, you know, it's interesting and I'm going to be completely open, but for many years in my practice, when people would ask me, Dr. Yoon, I'm on these supplements, what should I do? I mean, I went through all this training and never learned anything about supplementation, zero. And it wasn't until I realized how much I didn't know that I started really studying it. And so I realized that when people would ask me, Dr. Yoon, what should I take supplementation wise? I would just tell them, get off of everything. Because I knew that certain supplements could increase your risk of bleeding, but I didn't know which ones could. And it didn't even cross my mind, honestly, that, oh, maybe you could take certain supplements that would actually help you heal better. And so when I realized, you know, as I had this patient I mentioned earlier who had this terrible complication, I started realizing like, oh my gosh, there's so much I was never taught about the underlying causes of aging, about different things we can do to age more slowly. And I thought, are there things that we can do to help us heal more quickly other than just the general stuff that we're taught of like avoid smoking, eat a healthy diet, make sure you have a decent amount of protein and follow the FDA recommendations essentially. And so I spent many, many, many hours actually studying two very different things. I went into our scientific literature and looked at wound healing studies and supplementation with wound healing in the surgical ICUs, which is where most of this, the the data in our scientific literature is from. It's from people who have pressure sores or they've been in a traumatic accident and they cannot move. And so you wind to try to supplement them by getting them enough nutrition to heal large wounds and stuff. So I looked at all of that and what supplements then they were being given to heal these large wounds and things. And I compared that to the books I was reading by alternative medicine physicians, by functional medicine doctors, and what they're recommending to reduce inflammation in the body, to help the, the skin heal faster, to, to, to age more slowly, to help to support the collagen and the overall health of the body. And I combined that into my own supplement protocol that I created. Uh, and at the time it was like, I think what, eight products or something. So there was products like there was uh, arginine, which was studied a ton in the scientific literature, not as much in natural medicine I've seen, but in the scientific literature, big, big on arginine, glutamine and other amino acids, because we do know that if you uh, undergo a general anesthesia and you, most people lose their appetite for a while, first thing that, that happens is your body breaks down skeletal muscle for energy. And so we want to really supply it with sufficient amino acids to help slow down or even stop that breakdown of skeletal muscle. A daily probiotic, okay? Because most people who have surgery, they're on antibiotics. It clears out their microbiome. We want to support it. Bromelain and, oh, what's the other one I'm thinking? It's called Sinec. It's blank in my mind, but they're herbals essentially that are anti-inflammatory. Bromelain is the one that is an enzyme in pineapples that people have taken for long, long time to help reduce inflammation, to help wounds potentially heal faster. And so we combine that with a daily multivitamin, okay, to help preventing nutritional deficiency. And by adding all of those types of things together, I create this basically pre and post-surgical supplement protocol. Then we add omega-3 fatty acids after two weeks because we don't want to impact bleeding with that. So you got to wait two weeks and you start it. And for many years, I used that for my own patients. And I found that the amount of complications that we had dropped, people seemed to heal faster. I had a lot of patients who would come to me and we would start them on this protocol after surgery just to help them heal faster. And then they would come back and they would buy the probiotic from us, or they would buy the multivitamin because they said, geez, I've never felt so good. You know, I just had surgery. I feel great. You know, or I have people say they take the probiotic. They're like, my gut feels great. Like I've, always had issues with IBS and now my gut feels fantastic. It's like, so it's crazy what that was doing. And, and so the interesting thing since then is that I created this thing and I never publicized it because I was worried that 
Somebody would buy it from me, get it from my office. They would have surgery by a different surgeon. They would have a complication, like a bleeding complication. It can happen to anybody. It just, you know, sometimes patients bleed afterwards, no matter how good of an operation to do and what they're on, it can happen. And now here's a convenient scapegoat for that surgeon. Like, oh, I did the surgery right, but it was those supplements you got from Dr. Yoon. That's why you bled. And I didn't want to open up that Pandora's box. So I never publicized it. But the interesting thing now, Kate, is that there are companies and one that I actually use now called HealFast that basically use the exact same things that I recommend, but they're now commercially selling it to surgeons and stuff. So it's kind of interesting now. So there are definitely things you can do to help heal faster and, and get that healing process going. That's great. I love, again, this is why you're called the holistic plastic surgeon, because you're doing, you're caring for the whole person before, during. And Trying, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's get into some of the procedures and even some of the like devices that you think are worth the money. And we won't have time to go through exactly how all of them work, but kind of like what's worth the hype? What's not in your mind? So the first thing that I encourage people to do is, let's say you have limited resources and you don't have access to a med spa or it's too expensive or you don't want to go to a dermatologist, then one easy thing you can do, I'm a big fan, is red light therapy. Red light therapy comes in a lot of different versions. You could have handheld devices I'm not big fans of because it's kind of hard to move it around your face all the time and stuff. There are masks that you can wear that are kind of creepy looking and those work really well. There are square tabletop type things that you can do and put that everywhere. But those really work. I think, you know, when you actually look at the, the belief of how they work, basically, is that the energy from the red light helps to power the mitochondria of your cells to create more ATP. And so essentially, it's energizing your cells and, and the mitochondria. And what do the studies show? Well, there are a handful of studies that have looked at red light therapy and skin quality afterwards and found that doing it a minimum of a month, uh, realistically, can take a couple of months to see it. It can increase the collagen and the elastin in your skin. So I am a fan of red light therapy. Is it going to do the same as, let's say, an aggressive laser that you get from a dermatologist? No, but these are things, there's something definitely that you can do at home that's super easy, that's affordable for many people. So that's a super simple thing at home that you can do. Another very simple thing, one of the most popular treatments in our office is dermaplaning. Dermaplaning is basically getting rid of the upper layer. It's exfoliating the upper layer of skin, getting rid of that vellus hair. So if you feel like your face is kind of furry, then it can get rid of that. Uh, we do that in, in a lot of med spas, dermatologists, plastic surgeons offices, they do that. It can cost $100 to $200 a treatment, but you can actually get dermaplaning blades. You can get them on Amazon, like I think Schick and Gillette even make them. And, and it's a fancy way essentially of shaving your face, but it works. And you'll feel your skin's going to feel softer and smoother afterwards. Super simple, super easy. I love it. I do it. And my husband's like, what are you shaving your face? And I'm like, pretty much, yeah, but it, it works. It, it makes my skin look younger. I love it. If you're looking for like a natural way to plump up your lips, you know, obviously we've got injectable filler. Don't get those pumps where you're putting suction on your lips because that can be harmful. But one very simple thing, and this is a real easy hack, is you've got your lip gloss. Take some food grade peppermint oil. And if you put just a couple of drops into it, into your gloss and then mix your gloss together, then apply the gloss to your lips. Most of the topical lip plumpers function by creating some mild irritation to your lips. The lips themselves are very reactive. You know, that's why if somebody gets punched in the face, people get a fat lip. You don't hear them getting a fat chin or a fat cheek. It's always a fat lip because our lips are so reactive and they swell so quickly to even minor stimuli. And so one simple way to get your lips to actually be temporarily plumped up a little bit like I said, you take that food grade peppermint oil, got to be careful, not essential oil peppermint, but food grade peppermint oil, put a couple of drops into your lip gloss, mix it up, apply it. If your lips feel a little bit of stinging, a little bit of tingling, then that's pretty good. Obviously, if it stings and you got to clean it off, then toss it and use less next time. If you don't feel anything, then you haven't put enough in. Uh, but that's a nice, simple way that you can naturally plump up your lips. It's temporary. It may last an hour or two, but if you're going for an event or a family reunion or a date or something like that, then, you know, reapply, go to the bathroom and reapply it when you want. That's great. Now you have some, some minor procedures that aren't super expensive. There's not much downtime. What are your, some of your favorite procedures like that for people to consider? Yeah. So if you're going to go, if you have access to a med spa or dermatologist office, there's a couple of really good bangs for your buck. The first one would be microneedling. Microneedling, basically, you know, if you've ever had derma rollers, those are these little rolling pin type things with tiny little pins on them. The idea basically is you create acute trauma to the skin. Acute trauma, when you traumatize the skin, the collagen of the skin, 
it damages the collagen. And when the collagen heals, it heals in a tighter fashion. And so honestly, most of the laser treatments, chemical peels, all these things, they're doing the same thing. You're creating a controlled trauma to the skin. And when that skin heals, it heals in a tighter fashion. So lasers create controlled trauma by using light energy to create heat. Chemical peels do it by using an acid. Microneedling does it by making a tiny poke with a little pin. Now in doctor's offices, they can take that microneedling like you have a roller and they can actually make those needles go much deeper. And you're getting a still a controlled trauma to the skin, but a more aggressive one that's going to help the skin to heal in a tighter fashion, in a smoother fashion. Bonus, if you want to stay really natural with it, you can apply PRP to the surface of the skin after you do that. So what happens is, is you have this pin that goes into your skin. It creates a tiny little puncture, a little hole. And if you apply PRP, platelet-rich plasma, over the surface of the skin, then that PRP can seep into those tiny holes. And the growth factors in that PRP can actually help to rejuvenate your skin from the inside out. And that's all completely natural. Um, so that's usually pretty inexpensive. The, the great thing with microneedling is you can usually get a treatment for $100, $200, depending on where you live. And the reason why that's inexpensive is because the actual device is not that expensive to buy. Now, laser treatments can get much more expensive because those devices can be $100,000, $200,000. Well, the cost of that device is going to be passed off onto you, the patient. And that's why if I'm looking at bang for the buck, easy to heal procedures that don't cost a lot, I would stick with microneedling, chemical peels. Okay, that can be good bang for your buck because I can buy a bottle of acid for like $50 and I can treat you know, 10 patients with that. So you, the amount of cost to the office is not that high. So then the cost of the procedure to the patient is low as well. And then the other thing, if you are open to technology and paying a little bit more, IPL, intense pulse light, I think is great for the skin. If you've got issues with dark spots, then I would recommend combining a brightening cream with IPL. IPL stands for intense pulse light. What it does, it targets the brown spots in your skin. It will turn them darker. And then within a week or two, some of them will slough off. You do usually need a couple of treatments for optimal results, but I think that's really good bang for your buck. Sometimes you can get those for just a few hundred dollars for a treatment, depending on how much of an area you're treating. This is such good news to use. I love that you're sharing this. Thank you so much. I, I can hear people taking notes at home. I know you have limited time. So I, I have like two more questions for you because I think we, you have done an amazing job of telling people what they can do safely, what they can do inexpensively. And I want to just get your thoughts on some of the more controversial procedures in plastic surgery and just hear how you talk people through those. There's a lot of concern right now about breast implant illness. And I'm wondering if you could share your thoughts on that. And maybe if someone is really wary of having that procedure, but really wants some options for how to feel better, if there are other things they consider, like how do you counsel your patients about this? Yeah. So breast implant illness is a tough one. Just to give you the history of implants is that silicone implants have been used for decades. Uh, there was a big uproar in the late eighties, early nineties, where a lot of women thought that maybe these implants were making them sick. And so in 1992, the FDA uh, put a ban on silicone implants other than being used in an FDA approved study. So from the years of 1992 to 2006, the only breast implants being placed in the United States were saline filled implants. So they have an outer silicone rubber shell and saline on the inside. The silicone implants were being used on a limited basis as part of this study. Well, fast forward to 2006, the study results come out and they don't show that there's any specific connection between autoimmune diseases and symptoms like rashes. Uh, hair loss, muscle aches, joint pain, all that type of stuff. And so the FDA lifts the moratorium in 2006. Plastic surgeons take this as basically a total and complete exoneration of breast implants, saying that they're safe and that the, all of this worry about implants being bad for your health and people getting sick is hogwash. And that's that was the dogma for many, many years. So fast forward about another 10 years or so, and all of a sudden there are websites that are getting more and more popular. There are Facebook groups popping up, tens of thousands of women telling their stories about how their breast implants they believe made them sick and how after those implants were removed, they seem to get better. And then this really hits a peak, and I think it was 2019, 
where there were FDA uh, hearings on it, a black box warning placed on the implants. And so right now there are three kind of camps. There's the one camp, BII, quote unquote, advocates who say, you know, all implants are unhealthy and nobody should get them. They should ban them completely. They're toxic. And then there's the other extreme of certain plastic surgeons who are like, they're healthy for everybody. And all of these, you know, these women have got problems in their head. It's all in their head. It's, it's not the implants. And I, in my opinion, you know, as I think an open-minded doctor, I think like most things in life, the truth is somewhere in between. I do believe that implants can make people sick. I've seen that in my own patients. I have had patients I put implants in and they have gotten ill after a couple of years and then we've taken them out and they have gotten better. But my experiences aren't important. What do the studies show? You know, really that's what we want to see. What do the studies show? Okay. Unfortunately, Kate, the studies are limited. There is no study, and I would love it for there to be one that says this percentage of women who get implants develop BII symptoms. We don't know that number, okay? But what we do know, and there are multiple studies to show this, is if women have the symptoms of BII, like I mentioned earlier, you know, hair loss, brain fog, fatigue, rashes, muscle aches, all that, and they have their implants removed, they have anywhere from a 55 to 95% chance that their symptoms are going to improve. The vast majority of people, their symptoms improve. However, there's one group where they don't seem to improve. And those are patients who already have diagnosed autoimmune conditions. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you know, and you can feel it in your hands and your fingers, stuff like that. If you've got scleroderma, if you've got Sjogren's disease, if you've got any of these types of things, and they're previously diagnosed and you're being seen by a rheumatologist, you're being treated and you get implants taken out, it's very unlikely that your symptoms are going to get significantly better. Now, we don't know what causes it. There are some recent studies that have tried to look at causes of it. Are they due to heavy metals? Well, one recent study of 150, so 150 participants, not a lot of people, but one study that did look at the scar tissue surrounding breast implants and how much heavy metals were in that, did not find any sign that heavy metals appeared to be higher in people with BII versus people who don't have BII and even people who don't even have implants at all. So it's unlikely that it's heavy metals. It's possible that bacterial biofilm may have something to do with it. We don't know. And the only risk factors that we know about, there are a couple of small studies that show if you have a history of autoimmune disease, a history of severe allergies or IBS, maybe you might be at higher risk of BII. And so the science is not clear yet. Their studies are being done. More data is coming out, but it's, it's slow in coming. And so in general, my recommendation is if you can be happy and lead a healthy, happy life and be happy with your appearance without implants, then by all means, that's what you should try to do. If you cannot and you want to consider implants, you know what? There are a lot of patients that I put implants in who are so happy, they're healthy, I know a lot of healthcare influencers, alternative healthcare influencers, functional medicine physicians who have implants who are perfectly healthy. But just keep in mind that if you do get implants and you start feeling ill, you have these symptoms, your doctor can't figure it out, you got to consider implants may be a cause of it. I think that's really wise advice and very balanced approach to this topic that can be really charged. Usually when someone's talking about this, they come in kind of with one opinion. And I love that you educate people like this. I was surprised to read in your book, I think it was your age fix book, that there are other things people can do. Because, I mean, I talk to so many women who, you know, they feel like their body just belonged to other people for 10 years. Like they were breastfeeding, then they were pregnant and they feel like their body has changed so much and they want to look and feel more confident. And there's like devices that people can use that may actually help their breast tissue look different. I had no idea actually until I read your book, that was even an option. Yeah. And those are limited. There was one that was around at the time of my book called the Brava device. And it's interesting because it was these two huge suction cups that you put on your breasts. And it literally, it's a process of tissue expansion. Okay. And what is tissue expansion? You know, you may have seen photos of little kids who have these things implanted in their skulls that, that are huge. And, and, and essentially what we do is if in order to reconstruct tissue, sometimes we have to expand the tissue that's already there. And so I had a video actually on my Instagram recently about a young, beautiful young woman who had a big melanoma removed from her forehead, and then they put a skin graft over it. And then she had two big tissue expanders on each side of her head. And these are basically balloons that you gradually fill with saline, with, with sterile saline solution. And what that does, it gradually expands or stretches the skin. 
Uh, when you get enough skin stretched out, then you remove the expanders and then you use that skin that's been stretched out to reconstruct an area that technically didn't have enough skin in the first place. And so if you stretch your skin, you can increase the amount that you have. I mean, it's the same thing. A woman gets pregnant and there's tissue expansion right there in their tummy. Now, there is this device that, that operate on using vacuum to expand the, the skin of the breast. And the belief was that if you suction cupped your breast and you had to do it like 20 hours a day out of literally 24 days, like crazy the amount of you know, hours. And you had to do it for like a, a few months, you could gain like maybe half a cup size. And so some people did that. The amount of change you get is fairly modest. That device now has gone out of business. So I don't think it's available anymore unless you find like a vintage device on eBay. Uh, I have one in my closet, but I don't think it works if you want it, you can try it. But somebody used it at some point. They gave it to me as a gift when they got their implants. <laughs> but one thing that I discourage people from that's a big issue right now is fat grafting. Some people inject fat in their breasts as an option. That I'm not a big fan of. My concern is that when you have one in nine women get breast cancer in their lifetime, we know that the breasts are a cancer-prone organ. I mean, they are. And what happens when you inject fat, which is chock full of stem cells into a person's breast? What if they have some dysplastic, abnormally growing cells that are maybe a small cluster that you don't even know about and you inject a bunch of stem cells around it, is that gonna cause those cells to expand more quickly? Would it possibly increase your risk of breast cancer earlier in life than maybe you would get? We don't know this. And so one of the things I do discourage people from, as much as it may sound natural and be a great option, is fat grafting to the breast. Just be aware that, that there's a theoretical risk there that I don't think has been truly answered yet. Again, I love how transparent you are. And and in your books, you help people kind of like even think about how to use things like makeup to address problems that they may have thought they needed surgery for, but a couple of tweed your eyebrows a certain way, use makeup a certain way, highlight contour. So definitely everyone who's listening, please go buy Dr. Yoon's books and you can see those tips that he talks about and they, they can make a huge difference. While we still have you on the line, I want to ask you one last thing. What do you think about Botox? There are people who are terrified of it. There are people who inject it everywhere. Like, where are we at with the Botox debate? Is it good? Is it bad? What do you tell your patients? Okay, so the first thing coming from a functional medicine type of root cause, functional medicine type of uh, audience is, is it harmful? It's been used, it really, it's the most studied and used cosmetic treatment probably in the history of the world. We started using it in the mid to late 90s and Every, every year here in the United States, you get like 7 million people have it done. Uh, in my practice, we've been doing it for 20 years. My guess is we have treated, I don't know, 30,000 people maybe as a guess. I have never seen a significant complication from it. The worst we've seen is a little bit of a droopy eyelid, I think on two patients that went away. Now, that being said, like anything, I think there are, there are stories of people who've had systemic illnesses that they believe maybe due to Botox. It's possible. I just haven't seen it. So I think the risk of that, unlike let's say breast implant illness, that risk, I think, is extremely low from what we can tell. Botox is a neurotoxin. It's a very powerful toxin that basically prevents the transmission of nerve impulses into a muscle for about three months. And so we can inject it into certain muscles that create wrinkles. These wrinkles typically, more traditionally, are the frown lines between the eyebrows, the horizontal lines of the forehead, and the crow's feet radiating out from the outer eyelids. Those are the three most common areas that we inject Botox. It's FDA approved for that, that purpose. By making tiny injections of the Botox into those areas, it prevents those muscles from contracting and that smooths those wrinkles out for about three to four months. There's a newer version called Daxify. You may get upwards of six months out of that one if you're looking for a longer term result. So what are the negatives? Like I said, an exceedingly probably small amount of risk of some type of a systemic illness. That's always possible, but once again, I think it's really rare. And then there's always a risk you're just gonna look kind of funky just because everybody's faces are different. My recommendation, if you've never tried Botox, you wanna try it, stay away from the forehead. That has the highest risk, in my opinion, of altering how your eyebrows look. That's when you see certain celebrities in Hollywood where they get kind of that weird brow. And I'm not saying anything about Nicole Kidman. I think she's a fantastic actress. I'm not saying anything about her, but yeah, if you get it done a certain way, it can cause your eyebrows to arch really funny and stuff. You stay away from the forehead. You just do the frown lines between the eyebrows or the crow's feet. And typically that's not going to change your appearance all that much, except kind of smooth those lines. Start with something like that. See if you like it. If you do, you get addicted to it. But that's, that's Botox in a nutshell. 
This is awesome. We're going to have to have you back. Oh, I'd love to come back. Thank you. Yeah, please. And and I can't thank you enough for publishing all of the videos you've published, answering people's questions all the time on Instagram, on TikTok, for writing your books. I think you have a really cool balanced approach that we really need right now. And yeah, I'm just so grateful for you. So thank you. I appreciate it. And I also have my own podcast called the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show as well that I try to share a lot of this on too. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all this information. It's been a lot of fun to chat with you. Absolutely. We'll do it again soon. Thank you, Dr. Yoon. Welcome to Root the Health, the best place to order, manage, and track results from over 30 different lab companies in one single place for free. It's going to take you under two minutes to sign up and you can order any functional medicine lab for your client in under 30 seconds. Let me show you how it's done. So here's our beautiful interface. I'm typing in the name of my client, selecting the lab that I want to order for them, and hitting send. From there, Rupa and their amazing team handle the rest. They email the client, collect payment, and even offer an interest-free three-month payment plan. We've also built the world's largest library of information about chronic health conditions, the lab tests that can help you find the root cause, and the evidence-based interventions that you can use to help people heal from them. It's called the Ruba Health Magazine. There, we have in-depth articles about almost any health condition you can imagine. And we give you step-by-step -step protocols that other clinicians have used to help their clients heal and that are verified by evidence-based sources. You should totally check it out and it'll transform your practice. And we can't wait to see you. So make sure you sign up today at rubahealth.com.